Well, good morning, Mount Gilly. Would you stand with us today? We're going to worship God this morning. Here we go. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Mount Gilead. We are so glad that you are here to worship our Savior Jesus Christ today. Thank you guys for being here. If you are not currently involved in one of our amazing groups, are not taking a class, or are not serving in one of the great ministry areas here at Mount Gilead, we want to encourage you to get involved in one of our three key environments today. You can do so by going to the Information Center, or you can pull out your phones and go to the app, and you can get plugged into one of our environments this morning. Also, if you are new with us today, we want to encourage you to fill out a connection card because we want to know that you are here. You can do that by filling out the paper connection card in the chair in front of you, or you can go to the app and fill out your connection card, and we will get that directly today. For everything that you need this Sunday morning, you can find it all in the app from your Bible to sermon notes to the amazing set list that we have this morning. So be sure to open that up. You can get everything you need for today. Now, greet somebody next to you and tell them you are glad they are here to worship God this morning.
give you glory for all you brought me through. And now I'm ready for whatever you want to do. I'm moving forward to follow after you. And now I'm ready for whatever you want to do. It's your presence. Your presence is an open door. We want you, Lord, like never before. Your presence is an open door. So come now, Lord, like never before. Strike to it, Lord. Come on. In every season. Your grace has been enough, and I'm believing the best is yet to come, only yet to come. The cross before me, my hope on things above, and in you, Jesus, the best is yet to come. Let's give the Lord praise today, church. Amen. What a way just to, to declare this morning that our God is good. Hey, this morning we want to do a new song today. I believe the Lord loves new songs. In fact, he even said, it said, sing to the Lord a new song. And um, before we do that, I felt like I just wanted to kind of introduce this song. Um, you know, what's so great about the Psalms is they're so poetic, and we get a glimpse of what was in the hearts and the minds of David and the other psalmists who wrote through that book. And I wonder, you know, I wonder if, if David had met Jesus, if David had seen an empty tomb, if he had seen his Savior on a cross and understood the concept of grace, what would his psalms be like today? And I feel like this song that we're going to do next, I feel like that, 
that might be the way that he would have written this psalm. Before we do that, I want to read a scripture that does come from the Psalms, and it's Psalm 139. And this is what it says. It says, I can never escape from your spirit. I could never get away from your presence. If I go up to, the, to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, you're there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. And the point being is that there is no place that you can go where you could escape the presence of God because God in spirit surrounds us. So whether you're today, you're, you've come in here and your life's on the mountaintops and things are going great, that's awesome. God's spirit is there. If you're going through a valley right now, that's great because God's spirit is there. And I firmly believe that our faith is built in the valleys. So if you're going through a season right now that you may be going through a valley, just know that God is building your faith and his spirit is there with you. So the song we're going to sing this morning is called Highlands. Summit where my feet are. 
So I will praise you in the valleys all the same. No less God within the shadows. No less faithful when the night leads me astray. You're the heaven where my heart is. Oh. Wherever I stand And ever I walk through The valley of death I sing through the shadows My song of a sin Whatever I walk through Wherever I am Your name can move a mountain Wherever I stand And if ever I walk through The valley of death I'll sing through the shadows My song of a sin My song of a sin Whoa, whoa Oh, it's my song It's my song of a sin Whoa Come the pastors we call grace A mighty river flowing upward From a deep but empty grave Come on So I will praise you on the mountains And I will praise you in the mountains in my way You're the sun where my feet are So I will praise you in the valleys all the same No less God within the shadow No, no less faithful when the night leads me astray You're the heaven where my heart is In the highlands and the heartache all the same Amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you, oh Jesus, Jesus, the name above every other name, Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. We live for you. It's only there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to the Sing his name is Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. So we live for you. We sing holy. Heart and lead in your love. 
You may be seated. As our servers come forward this morning and we prepare to take communion, it's important to remember that this is a time where we can reflect on the sacrifice that Jesus made for us and the miracle of his resurrection. Let's remember the faith that we have is a faith that is rooted in a God who brings life to the lifeless a God who is always faithful. And because of that, we are faithful. Just as it says in Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him. Through Christ Jesus, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray as we prepare for communion today. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful for your son Jesus. We're thankful to have the opportunity to remember his sacrifice for us and the perfect miracle of his resurrection Lord, help us to continue to be faithful because we know that you are always faithful. Be with us today. Help us to remember your son Jesus and what he did for us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.
As we prepare for our offering time today, it's important to remember the impact that giving can have and the different areas that giving here at Mount Gilead goes to. Today, I want us to remember that as you guys give, it goes to impacting so many kids and families here at Mount Gilead. By giving on Sunday morning, you are blessing brand new families who are bringing um, their children to baby dedication in just a few weeks. You are helping participate in the spiritual development of our kids here at Mount Gilead by providing us with resources to help parents, to help families, and to raise these kids up for God. And so as you give today, remember that. Remember that you are participating in building up the future of the church. And by giving, you are having an impact on the lives of families and kids here at Mount Gilead. Will you pray with me as we prepare to give today? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful for the opportunity to give back, Lord, because we know that you have given so much to us. Lord, I just pray that as we give, we give as an extension of our faith in you, faith in a God who is always faithful. Open our hearts and minds to you in this time, Lord, as we participate in this part of worship. It's your name that we pray. Amen. So just like I said, we have baby dedication celebration coming up in a few weeks. And if you have welcomed a new addition to your family in the past year or so, we want you to join us for our baby dedication. This is an opportunity for parents to dedicate themselves to raising their children for Jesus and celebrate that together with our congregation. This event is on March 20th on Saturday morning, and we always celebrate all of our new babies on March 21st during services on Sunday morning. So you can sign up online today or register through the app. Camp Allendale is for kids and students in first through eighth grade. And that is either a weekend for our first and second graders or a week-long event for uh, kids in grades third through eighth. And it is an amazing week experience for these kids <clears throat> where they get to experience God and in a unique and exciting environment. Um, for the dates and more information on how to sign up and where to sign up, we actually have Randy Pym, the director of Camp Allendale, in a booth in our lobby today. So you can stop by there and get all the information you need to get your kids signed up for Camp Allendale this summer. We are also excited to announce American Idol finalist and Grammy nominee Danny Gokey is bringing his Better Than I Found It tour to Mount Gilead Church. This is gonna be on April 19th, and it will be right here on that Sunday evening. You won't want to miss this incredible night with Danny Gokey. For tickets, you can follow our link on the website or you can sign up through our app today. Now, if you'll pull out your phones or your Bibles and open up as we prepare for the sermon today. Good morning, Second Service. How about a big shout out today to uh, Justin White for wrapping up our Finding Rhythm series last week. I always appreciate it when Justin preaches. And I have gotten massive uh, positive feedback. I do every time Justin uh, preaches. In fact, uh, Brian Hopwood, who's here in this service, came up to me and he said, Jeff, thank you for letting Justin preach. I, I was finally able to stay awake through a whole sermon. And so um, for those of you who don't know who Bryant Hopwood is, he's one of my former friends. And, uh, <laughs> did you know 38% of American beer drinkers have decided that they would not buy Corona beer because of the fear and the spread of the coronavirus? They got the stories mixed up. It's a really bad time for Corona Beer because they were just launching a $40 million uh, ad campaign. 
Bad things happen when we don't get our stories straight. And then right on the heels of that, the Atlantic Monthly Magazine came out with an article that said, actually, those statistics were misleading because of those 38%, 34% weren't going to buy Corona beer anyway. They don't like it. So it was really only 4% who were affected by the coronavirus, but we were misled with statistics. Bad things happen when we don't get our stories straight. Also this week, social media mobs erupted across the country in rage against a star country singer, Garth Brooks, after they saw a picture of him backstage in Michigan where he was doing a concert, and he was wearing a Detroit, Michigan football jersey with Barry Sanders' name on it. And they wrongly assumed that he was advertising for presidential candidate Bernie Sanders, and they went off on him. I'm thinking that next uh, KFC and Colonel Sanders might be in trouble because bad things happen when we don't get our stories straight. On top of that, a singer by the name of Ian Watkins, he sang with a group called uh, Lost Prophets, was convicted as a pedophile, a child molester. But there's another singer named Ian Watkins. He sings for a group called Steps in the UK, and he began to receive all the hate mail and death threats as a result of the other Ian Watkins conviction, as did an Australian businessman by the name of Ian Watkins who actually fights human trafficking. They didn't get the three stories straight, and bad things happen when we don't get our stories straight. But it's not just people who are falsely accused, is it? It's why crime suspects are separated before being interviewed so that they don't have an opportunity to get their stories straight. It's why we see deceit and hypocrisy in politicians because they don't have their stories straight. It's, it's why when we suspect our kids of, of lying to us, uh, we tell them to get their stories straight. It's why conservatives and liberals alike get angry at what they deem as biased media reports because they're upset if they believe the media didn't get their stories straight. Uh, Bad things happen when we don't get our stories straight. So today we're starting a brand new study, a study of a little book in the New Testament uh, called uh, Galatians, and we've subtitled this Getting the Gospel Right because the gospel is one thing that we cannot afford to get wrong. And Paul knew that. And he saw the Christians in the region of Galatia getting the gospel wrong. And so he wrote them this little letter of Galatians to help them get it right. And so we're going to kick off in Galatians chapter 1 today, and we're going to start by getting our stories straight in Galatians chapter 1. And we'll start with the most important story in Galatians chapter 1. It's the Jesus story. It is a story of gospel simplicity. What if I ask you to describe for me the essence of the gospel? What if I said, please tell me what the gospel is. Give me a definition of the gospel. How would you do it? Would you just say, well, the gospel is the good news, because that's what the word gospel means. The word gospel just means good news. Or better yet, what if I said, tell me what the gospel is, but just use one verse of Scripture to describe the gospel to me. Would you use John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life? That's the gospel. Or would you use 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8? God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the gospel. Or would you go to that iconic passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where Paul said, I made the gospel known to you that Christ died and he was buried and he rose again on the third day, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. That's the gospel. If I asked you to describe the simplicity and the essence of the gospel, how would you describe the gospel to me? Well, how about this one? Right here in the beginning of Galatians, in chapter 1, It's part of Paul's greetings and opening words to the Christians in Galatia. By the way, I love the the greetings and the benedictions and the doxologies in the Bible, and sometimes I listen to an app that just has the greetings and the doxologies and the benedictions. If you're into Bible apps, there's one called Dwell. It's the best $25 you'll ever spend on a Bible app. So you listen to these doxologies, and what I see when I get in the opening chapter of Galatians in verse 3, just three verses in, are these words, a description of the gospel. 
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forevermore. Amen. Did you hear that? The Lord Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age. That's the gospel. The gospel, the Jesus story, in its simplest form, is the good news of God's great rescue operation. You might have seen this last week. Uh, an 18-year-old a high school senior from California named Quincy Webster volunteered for a search and rescue team with the Marin County uh, Sheriff's Search and Rescue Team. He, he spent most of his winter break searching the backwoods for a missing couple. They were an elderly couple in their uh, 70s, Ian Irwin and Carol Kaparski, and they had been missing for nine days ever since they left their rental cottage uh, on Valentine's Day. And by the time Saturday rolled around, the rescue effort had officially shifted into a recovery operation. I mean, think about it. An older couple uh, lost in the woods for over a week where the temperatures had dipped down low that week. And yet here was this young 18-year-old man, Quincy, and a, a canine handler named Rich Cassens and a golden retriever named Groot. And this Quincy was on his very first search and rescue assignment. They crawled through the mud and the brambles and the trees and the thickets, and they had to hack it down. It was slow going. They advanced through the gnarled morass of undergrowth and the brambles that were uh, smothering the uh, terrain. And instead of finding dead bodies and recovering them, they found this couple weak and exhausted but very much alive. They attended to their immediate needs and then they waited for the rescue helicopter. Not a bad ending, not only for the couple, but also for this 18-year-old high school student on his very first search and rescue attempt. Something beautiful about a successful rescue operation. On the contrary, one of the most terrible rescue stories I've ever heard is the Floyd Collins story. Anybody here know the Floyd Collins story? It's a true story. 1925, uh, Floyd Collins was exploring some caves down in Kentucky. He had already discovered a cave that he called Crystal Cave, and it had become a tourist attraction, but most of the tourist business came to Mammoth Cave instead of his cave. And so Floyd was determined to discover a new and better cave. It was during a time in history uh, known as the Cave Wars. And breaking all the rules of caving, Floyd went alone. He didn't notify anyone of where he was going. He didn't have any proper equipment. And he got himself trapped in a tiny uh, claustrophobic passageway, and nobody knew where he was for several days until his brother Homer went out looking for him, and Homer found him, and he was still alive, and Homer went off for help, and the rescue operations began. And during that attempted rescue, the media arrived, and the story began to be uh, broadcast across the nation. As a matter of fact, little known of fact, that story was ranked as the third biggest news story between the two world wars followed the, the crossing of the Atlantic by uh, Charles Lindbergh. It was such a big story that people came from all around to gawk, and there was no parking for 10 to 12 miles around the site. An estimated 25 to 50,000 people gathered there around that cave out of curiosity and excitement. Uh, peddlers sold their wares. Carnivals actually set up pony rides for the kids. The military had to cordon off the area, and the would-be rescuers sat around arguing about how to reach Floyd in time. And after about a month uh, in the cave suffering from misery and cold and pain and hunger, uh, Floyd Collins died just hours before the rescue teams could reach him. There's more to this story. It's fascinating. They actually put his body in a glass coffin, and it was on display in Kentucky in a museum for a long time. A failed rescue. The rescue story of the gospel is not a failed rescue operation. It's not even a rookie rescuer who stumbled upon some missing persons in a fortunate sequence of events and circumstances. The gospel story is God's precisely designed and executed rescue of humanity, of you and me, 
planned from the foundation of the world. And the whole book of Galatians is written to elevate that simple story of Jesus and to protect and preserve it so that nobody messes that story up. I mean, listen to the words that were spoken way back around the birth of Jesus and John the Baptist, his forerunner, Luke 174. To grant to us that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear. And later the Apostle Paul would write in Colossians 1 and verse 13, he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. From our enemies, from temptation, from the wrath to come, the story of Jesus is a rescue story. And all of the chapters of this little book of Galatians were written to show us that rescue story and to say, don't mess with this rescue story. Leave it alone. Don't add to it. Don't subtract for it. Get the story straight. Get the gospel right. But it's not just the Jesus story, gospel simplicity in chapter 1. There's also the Paul story. And the Paul story, the guy who wrote Galatians, is a story of apostolic authority. He's an apostle, and because of that, he has authority. And so the book of Galatians starts with that in verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not sent from men nor through the agency of men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Now, can you imagine if you could get just one hour to sit down with the great apostle Paul and say, Paul, uh, Tell me your story. I mean, where would Paul start with the story? He could tell you about some of the more familiar things about his life, his, his adventures at sea, uh, the time he was bitten by a snake and survived, uh, the great basket escape when they let him down over the wall in a basket, or the time he was preaching and there was a guy that was sitting in the window. Uh, his name was Eutychus, and Eutychus fell asleep and fell out the window and died right in the middle of the sermon. I'm glad there's no windows in here today because that's not going to happen. There was the time when he had an argument, a face-to-face argument with the Apostle Peter. There were times he was stoned and left for dead. There was a time he had a vision of the third heaven. Uh, There were the, what, 13-some books of the Bible that he wrote. But those are just some of the more well-known incidents. There are many incidents in his life that are somewhat obscure in Scripture and, and some that come from tradition and some which I'm sure were never recorded. I mean, if you ask Paul to tell you a story, he could say, well, let me tell you about the time when the Jews were pursuing me and I had a personal escort of 472 soldiers as bodyguards. Or let me tell you about the time when I had to give my testimony in front of the king and the king was more scared than I was. Or let me tell you about the time when I mouthed off to the high priest because I didn't realize he was the high priest and they slapped me around for it. Or let me tell you about the time when I dissed and dogged the Roman government by flashing my Roman citizenship card and they didn't know I was a Roman citizen. Or let me tell you about the time when I took upon a, a, a sorcerer who tried to cast a spell on me. Or the day I accidentally incited a riot. Or let me tell you about the time when the emperor, Nero, he took off on a trip. And while he was gone, I converted his mistress. And when he got back, she was gone. Or, or let me tell you about the time when I spent extended moments alone in the desert of Arabia with Jesus. I kind of take personal interest in Paul's story because it might have something to do with me being in ministry. My dad was a preacher, and when he was a kid, he watched a, a series of films about the Apostle Paul, and he was so inspired by what he saw that he decided he wanted to become a preacher. So if Paul was telling his story, what would Paul say? Well, it's right here, Galatians chapter 1. Here's how he tells the story here. Verse 13, you've heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure, and I I tried to destroy it, and I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. But when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then, three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas, that's, that's Peter, and I stayed with him 15 days, but I didn't see any of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now, in what I'm writing to you, I assure you before God, I'm not lying And then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but only they kept hearing, he who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they were glorifying God because of me. 
That's how Paul told his story. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but his journeys took him through four major Roman provinces, Galatia, Asia, Achaia, and Macedonia. His ministry spanned 35 years, and the three journeys themselves took about eight years with Antioch serving as his home base. We talk usually about his three missionary journeys. First missionary journey took Paul and Barnabas through Antioch, uh, Lystra, Iconium, synagogues, mar marketplaces, and homes. They were threatened. They were attacked. They were, uh, there were those who attempted to worship them. They were misunderstood and deserted and betrayed. Second missionary journey found them in uh, Asia Minor and Greece. Uh, that was after he parted company with Barnabas and he had Silas as his companion. His adventures continued with prison in Philippi, uh, trials in Thessalonica, Bible study in Berea, academics in Athens, and he witnessed carnality in Corinth. And then the third missionary journey introduced him to exorcists and economics 101 in Ephesus. And my temptation is to get bogged down in all the details here because I find them interesting, but they don't really serve our purpose. How many stamps did Paul have on his passport? How many total miles did he travel? How many nights did he spend on the road? How many new cities did he enter? I figured that Paul must have traveled during his missionary journeys about 5,000 miles, and I talked to Dave Thurman about it, and he gave me a more exact figure, approximately 6,000 miles when you include his trip to Rome. And one writer observed, some people say that a man they call St. Christopher is the patron saint of travelers, and if I believed in that kind of thing, I would put Paul up for the award. So you got the Jesus story, the simplicity of the gospel, and then you got the Paul story, it's apostolic authority, and he just tells his story, and what a story it is. Then there's a third story in chapter 1, because we're trying to get our story straight, right? Because we want the story of the gospel straight. So the third story in Galatians chapter 1 is the Galatian story, the people to whom the letter was written. And it is a story of gospel distortion because they were distorting the gospel, or maybe I should say it this way, they were allowing people to infiltrate their churches and distort the gospel, and they were falling for it. In fact, the original recipients of this letter, the Galatians, received this letter because Paul wanted to put a stop to the distortions of the gospel. Listen to how he says it. He gets kind of harsh. Chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said it before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. Now, those are strong words, but some people had come into the Galatian churches, and they were adding to the requirements of the gospel, and they were turning the gospel, the good news, into bad news. And the people from the Galatian churches were falling for it. And Paul lets them and us know that it's a serious issue to corrupt the genuine wonder and simplicity of the gospel. And quite honestly, when Paul writes this letter, he's a little different than he is in the other letters. Usually in the letters that Paul writes, he's got these big, long greetings. And then he's saying, well, say hi to so-and-so and say hi to so-and-so and say hi to so-and-so. And, -so. and he just gets right down to business, this, and he gets right in their face. I'm amazed. I'm astonished that you're leaving the pure, simple gospel for another gospel which is not really a gospel at all. I think as a preacher, Paul is frustrated here. Now maybe Paul might have felt like all preachers do at one time or another, or maybe like the preacher in this little clip. It's my favorite preacher clip. It's called Honest Preacher. Watch it with me. If I may digress for a moment from my prepared message, I mean it when I say to you, you guys, sometimes you're bad. Don't be jerks. 
You're supposed to be good. I'm in my office every day and somebody comes in and they're like, hey, whoops. I'm like, don't. Dan, what is your deal? If anybody doesn't know, Dan is the worst. I took a vow to not say who was the worst, but it's Dan. You guys are making me look bad in front of God. What's that? Oh, look, it's Jesus. And he said, stop it. The word of the Lord. You want to know who the worst is here? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so the Galatian story is one of distortion, and, and Paul's upset about it. I want you to listen to how uh, directly, almost harshly, Paul addresses this with his friends. And these are just little snippets that I pull uh, from the, the chapters in the book of Galatians. He says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Later in the same chapter, he says, are you so foolish then he said, I, I fear for you, for perhaps I've labored over you in vain. Another time he said, I'm perplexed about you. You were, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? I mean, Galatians, Paul gets in their face. He's pretty rough because the Galatians, it's not that they were doing bad things. They were trying to do good things thinking they would be saved by doing those good things. The Galatians were buying into a lie that took the gospel of Jesus and turned the gospel of Jesus into Jesus plus law-keeping. And Paul wanted them to reject this false gospel no matter where it came from because the true gospel came from God. And what Paul knew is that when you try to add anything to the beautiful gospel of Jesus, you ruin it. Because the gospel is not Jesus plus anything equals salvation. The gospel is it's Jesus over and instead of everything. And so Paul isn't really himself here because he's so passionately, or maybe he is totally himself. He is passionately and urgently and adamantly and uncompromisingly and insistently fighting for the essence of the gospel and the spiritual future of the Galatian Christians. In fact, he says in verse 10, am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I wouldn't be a bondservant of Christ, for I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me was not according to man. I neither, I neither received it from man nor was I taught it. I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, the gospel is not of human origin. It's not man-made. It didn't come from this world. It came into this world. So we've got three stories going on here. We've got the Jesus story, the simplicity of the good news of the gospel. And we've got the, the Paul story. It's about his apostolic authority. And then we've got the Galatian story, which was a distortion of the gospel. And the rest of the book of Galatians is going to be elevating this beautiful gospel of Jesus and protecting it from anything that would distort it. But there's one more story as we kind of kick this off in Galatians chapter 1. And that is the you story. But personal reality. In other words, the benefit in our world that we find in Christ is not found in the law. It's not found in our accomplishments. Our status with God is defined only through Christ's saving work on the cross. That the reason Jesus Christ can see Christians as righteous, the reason God sees us as righteous is because of what Jesus did on the cross, not of something we did to earn it. And that's the personal reality that Paul wants to protect throughout the book of Galatians. My son Trey preached on this passage of scripture and he sent me this little paragraph that he wrote about it. He said, I want you to think real deep about your guilt that weighs you down from fully experiencing God's grace. What are those things that you're hanging on to? I want you to think real deep about the things you try to do to earn God's favor. What burdens do you carry around because you don't feel good enough? I want you to think deep about your life, he wrote. Think deep. Are those uncomfortable thoughts? Well, that's what sin does. That's what 
trying to be saved by law keeping does. It keeps us from experiencing the truly beautiful life that Christ has given us. It keeps us from experiencing the freedom that we have in Christ. Paul later wrote in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10 that we wait for God's Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus who does what? He rescues us from the wrath to come. Now, you've heard me say it before, and you'll hear me say it again. Every sermon is supposed to have a so what. If a sermon doesn't have a so what, then so what? It's just information. And if all we get is some information and we learn something about the Galatians and something about Paul and even something about Jesus, if there's no bridge, no application to our own lives, then so what? What's the so what of this sermon? What do we do in response to these stories. Well, I got to thinking about that this week. What, what do you do if, if, we're, if, if the gospel is a rescue and we've been rescued by Christ, what do you do when you are rescued? You, well, one of the things you do is you express relief and joy and, and gratitude. Would you take some time every day this week to ponder that, to build it into your language, to build it into your thoughts, to build it into your prayers? We need to live like rescued people, and rescued people live in relief and joy and and gratitude. What do you do when you're rescued? Well, when you're rescued, sometimes you have to recover and heal from your ordeal. We're rescued from sin, and sin leaves scars and consequences. We're forgiven of the guilt of our sin. Jesus removes the guilt of our sin. But sometimes the, the scars and the consequences are still there. We need to live like rescued people, full of joy and gratitude and relief, but we also need to recover from what he's rescued us from. And we scrupulously avoid being trapped again. Man, once you've been rescued from something, you don't want to go back to that. I wonder if Floyd Collins had been rescued, I wonder if he would have ever crawled in a cave again. You scrupulously avoid being trapped in wrong thinking and sin and activities. Maybe you've been delivered from legalism or maybe you've been delivered from addiction or lust or self-righteousness. You, you scrupulously avoid those traps because you're living like you've been rescued. And the last thing I think you do when you're rescued is you you join in the rescue of other people one way or another. It's one of my favorite old stories about a a family that was vacationing in their lake cottage one summer day, and Dad was working on a project, and their 12-year-old was playing on the dock with his little preschool-aged brother, and the little preschool kid uh, stood at the end of the dock, and he tried to get his foot in the family's fishing boat tied to the dock, and he got one little foot in, and the boat started to push away from the dock, and he, uh, he lost his balance, and he fell into the dark, murky water, and his, his older brother screamed, and, and his dad came running, went diving into the dark, murky water, and frantically fell around underwater trying to find his, his little boy, couldn't find him, came up for air, and he went back down again, and as he was down there the second time, he fell around, he still uh, couldn't find his, his son. But as he was coming up for air the second time, he happened to brush against the body of his little boy, uh, holding tightly uh, to the post, the dock, right under the surface of the water. So he went down again, and he grabbed his little boy, and he brought him up, and he was fine. They're sitting there on the dock, and he's talking to his little boy, and he said, Son, well, you were just hanging on down there. What were you doing hanging on down there? And without missing a beat, the little guy said, I was just waiting for you to come, Dad. Roughly 2,000 years ago, the Lord plunged into the dark, murky waters of our world to save us, and he left a place to do that where there is no darkness or suffering or pain. He, He left to come and rescue us. And so many of us were or are barely hanging on. We're so lost in the darkness of, of this life. But he came, and he rescued, and he's coming again. Mark my words, someday Christ will return. And when he does, we want to be holding on with a smile to say we're waiting for you to come. But we also want to take as many people as possible with us. And when we live as lifelong disciples of Jesus, and when we help other people in becoming lifelong disciples of Jesus, we are part of the greatest rescue operation ever. 
because the gospel is our rescue and the gospel is also the beginning of our rescue training. Can you just pray, Lord, rescue me and make me a rescuer. Now, we've seen it happen. When a person puts their trust, their faith and their trust in Jesus, it's a surrender to say, Lord, I can't save myself. Rescue me. When a person confesses with their mouth and they repent of their sins, it's a surrender. Lord, I can't do it. You rescue me. When a person is baptized, it's an act of surrender. Lord, I can't do it. You rescue me. Take me under. Bring me back up. Cleanse me. You rescue me. And if you've never allowed Jesus to rescue you today, man, today is your day. It's good news. And just outside these doors and on the right, there's a prayer room. There's somebody waiting there to talk with you, to help you. And I would urge you to surrender yourself to Jesus today. Now, Paul wrote the book of Galatians, but the last book that he wrote was a book in, near the end of your Bible called 2 Timothy. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 17, he wrote these words. He said, The Lord stood with me and he strengthened me so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was rescued out of the lion's mouth and the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and he will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. See, the gospel is that God has rescued you, but that when he comes again, he will rescue you to his eternal kingdom forever and ever. Amen. I praise him for his simple gospel. Let's pray. Lord, thank you today for this uh, start to this uh, book of Galatians. And Lord, you thought it important enough to include this little six-chapter book in your uh, Bible to help us celebrate the simplicity and the truth and the freedom and the beauty and the glory of the gospel and to keep it from being distorted. Lord, forgive us when we get it mixed up. Forgive us when we distort it. Help us to get our stories straight. And we thank you for the truth of the good news of your son, Jesus Christ. And we do that today in his name. Amen. Thanks for being here today. Have a great week celebrating the gospel.